Welcome. I am so pleased to introduce John Capasola, the former CEO of Del Taco. John led a massive organization through a global pandemic, and he didn't manage it. He led it with a central focus on caring for his team and his customers. Today, we're going to impact the practical, no-nonsense ways that you can navigate the difficult waters ahead by becoming a better leader and leveraging the most powerful tool in your arsenal, culture. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Josh Copel. I'm a Michelin-rated restaurateur, and I've spent the last couple of years talking about running restaurants instead of running them. And I've done this with a singular goal in mind, to figure out the recipe for guaranteed success in the restaurant industry. I also host Full Comp, a podcast that airs twice weekly, unpacking the tools, tactics, and strategies of our industry's greatest leaders. It's a selfish endeavor. I have the privilege of talking to folks that I idolize, and I only ask the questions that I want to ask. But this town hall is your turn. Today, John answers your questions that you've asked, and I encourage you to use the chat function to ask questions throughout our conversation if there's anything you want to dig deeper on. We're also leaving time at the end for Q&A. With that being said, welcome, John. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Josh. Appreciate it. Hello, everybody. All right. So we'll dig right in. Let me share my screen, and we will get this party started. So to start... Ooh, look at that. Good, good headshots. <laughs> we make a good team. Uh, how do you manage the inflationary effects on menus? Everybody's talking about it. Everyone's seeing it and everybody's deeply afraid in this moment. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess, Josh, what I'll probably do is just focus on, you know, strategically what you can control just in regards to the, you know, day-to-day -day management of the menu versus, you know, contracting and supply chain and commodities and things of that nature. So let me just kind of maybe just dive in on the basics here. Um, so I think, I think there's really you know, probably three levers that I think about a lot here. Um, you know, in, in, in you, you look at optimization, right? So that, you know, think about optimization in regards to, you know, what are your builds, your ingredients, you know, the, the ways that you are putting products, project, products together strategically without sacrificing quality. So that it's a really great experience for the guest, um, but but you know optimization is always, is always a lever that I like to you know challenge the team with and challenge ourselves with and make sure there's no sacred cows and and we're thinking open mindedly and creatively about it. Um, the other the other piece is you know menu mix right. I mean I think I think you know sell what you want to sell sell the things that are going to bring guests back that are great experiences for them but also things that you can help to tighten up those margins a little bit, make a little bit more money and help you so that you can, you know, you can address the, whether it be labor inflation or food inflation and not have to pass all that through to the guests, right? So be smart and strategic about the way you think about, you know, your, your, your menu and what you want to sell and that menu mix. Can you trade folks up to better experiences um, that helps your penny profit um, a little bit more, puts a little bit more dollars in the bank, that sort of thing. But but still, again, I, I want to come back to you're always trying to manage quality and experience, right? You're never, you should never be sacrificing those things. You, you know, there, there's that fine line, but you need to keep that guest perspective and point of view in place because what you don't want to have happen is lose a bunch of traffic, right? Um, and, then, and then obviously the third lever, and I think everybody's pressing it right now. A lot of folks are pressing it and that's price. And um, you know, heavy inflation periods, you tend to push on price a little bit more. Um, my, my, you know, my thinking on it is you just always want to be in a position where you understand what the, what, what the consumer can absorb, kind of what the marketplace looks like, what the competition looks like, you know, and, and what your brand can maybe get away with. So, you know, under understanding, you know, that really goes a long way and there's different ways to do that depending on how sophisticated um, your organization is, but ideally, if you could have some consumer data, um, you know, and even it's just a little bit on surveys you do through receipts or, you know, uh, you know, different survey platforms that you can do online that are relatively inexpensive, just a way to get a little bit of data to help you make those decisions. If you're a larger organization, that becomes much more, you know, easy to do because you have people that are working on that and focused on that all the time. But you, you certainly want to be careful with pricing. But when inflation runs the way it's run, you know that that's just a lever that's that's out there. So, optimization, you know, menu mix, pricing, those are probably the three you know core strategies that really help you, you know, as far as the things that you can help control in regards to your menu. Do you think that that 
somewhere in the country there's a town hall going on right now where it's a bunch of gas station owners sitting around <laughs> worried about inflationary rates and and pricing i i feel like it's so unique to our industry that that you know, we wring our hands over increasing prices where you see in so many other, I would argue, comparable commodity based industries where they say, yo, the cost of goods went up. We're passing that along to the customer. And you don't see gas station attendants running out, apologizing, right? Hey, I'm so sorry. I know it's a dollar more expensive today, but yeah. is that is, is that a cultural issue? Is that something that, that is that a relationship that we created between the customer? And do you think there's anything we can do to fix it? You, you, you know, perhaps, but I mean, I think you got to think about it from a standpoint of food at home and food away from home, right? I mean, it's, you can go and you can go to the grocery store and make your own food. You can brown bag it, or you can, for the, for convenience sakes, and you, you can go out and, you know, you can spend a little bit of money at a restaurant that makes it easier for you so that you don't have to maybe be as planful. Well, people have busy lives, right? I mean, so, so I think, I think, you know, Josh, there's that always that tension around what's the grocery store doing for us and what's the, you know, what a restaurant's doing. And, and clearly there are a lot of vectors in and around our consumer from a standpoint of disposable income that you got to consider. I mean, it is really unprecedented right now, what you're seeing with, you know, gas prices and, you know, what's happening at food away from home, food at home, you, you layer in all the other things that the guest is dealing with, you know, across the board. Um, you know, there's just right now is a very unique time. And this is where you just need to think about, okay, what can I can control? What can I control and really tighten down on those key levers and make sure you've got a good strategy that you can get your head around that makes good common sense that doesn't sacrifice your brand in the short run. And then high level, and this has nothing to do with, with your previous position, but if you were an independent restaurant owner today um, and you were facing the, these inflationary effects, I, I'm curious to know, would you sacrifice profitability to just exist for the next six months? Would you be nope. willing to work at a break-even rate? Would you be willing to work at a, at a slight loss? I mean, Lord knows there's certainly independent restaurant owners and operators that have done that for years prior to the pandemic. But is that a strategy? I think it is a strategy. Now, whether it's the right strategy for you, only only you can answer. And it, and it comes down to your your situation. And you know, I think you've got to think about what are my short term, my midterm and my long term goals and make sure that those are lined up with that strat with the strategy that you're going to deploy, whether that's a, hey, I'm going to work at a break even for a while or maybe at a slight loss for a while. But I've got a strategy that then helps me. Maybe maybe your goal is I want to I need more traffic. I want to take market share right now. So that's something that I've heard other operators say, which is you know, hey, this is a time where you could take traffic if you don't take as much price as, you know, the competitor down the street. And if I could take traffic and build my traffic at some point down the road, you know, that pricing will kick in over time and, and you really start to monetize that traffic. The, the big question is how long will that take and, 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 and how, you know, how thick skinned are you to be able to, you know, to, 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 you know, get through that. Cause I don't think anybody has a, nobody can predict what, what, you know, and how long this is going to last. So, you know, the other strategy is to adapt to the environment and, and that's where you, you, you really look at it and say, Hey, here's who I compete with. Here's who my consumer, when they're choosing to go out to my, to a restaurant, they, they're going to choose my restaurant or my concept, or they're going to choose these other concepts how do I fit in? You know, what, how am I fitting in? I mean, from a, not just from a price standpoint, but what's my value proposition look like? What does my experience look like? Can I add value in other areas that allow me to pass through a little bit higher pricing so that, you know, I'm not sacrificing, you know, um, and running, you know, running, you know, um, break even or, or worse for a period of time. So, it, 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 th those are just, I just, I'm very, these are very general frameworks that I'm referencing, but hopefully as everybody hears me talk about it, it's more, how does that apply to me? And, and maybe there's a, maybe there's a rational way of thinking there that helps you to kind of sit down and just write some things down relative to those frameworks. You start plugging in your own data, your own, your own strategy, et cetera, and get to a good place. But I think, I think this is the time to be very thoughtful about it. You have to be, I mean, is, everyone has to be, whether you're small, medium, large, it doesn't matter. Um, you gotta be really thoughtful and really think through these things and ask yourself the tough questions. I swear we're gonna move on, but I have one more question related to this. Cause I think, I think this is probably the most important. So 
there's a lot of fear around pricing. And so I, I'm wondering over the last few years, obviously pricing has adjusted. And were you surprised at the elasticity in the market? Were you surprised by the lack of pushback as prices go up? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I think. Listen, restaurants. There's there's an experiential element that is undeniable, especially in some of ours. You you move upstream in some of the categories um, of the restaurant, you know, category. I, and I think so. You know, people just went through a really tough time, and and last couple of years haven't been easy for many people. And and getting to escape and enjoy a restaurant or getting out and getting out of the house for a moment and enjoy, enjoy enjoying a meal with a friend or a family member. I mean, that is those are things you, you can't buy those things at a retail store. I mean, that is that makes you feel a certain way and it evokes certain feelings that are really tough to replace. So don't you know, I, I think I think that 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 piece is really important. And then the other aspect is convenience. Remember, folks are on the go. I mean, it. You get out and about in LA again, you get on the 405 or the five and it's just, you wouldn't even, you know, I mean, remember during the pandemic when there were no cars on the freeways out there? Oh, and yeah. now, I mean, it, it seems to be busier than it's ever been before out and about in, in Southern California. So, so again, convenience is really important to our category too. If you're in that, you know, QSR, you're in that fast casual space, or, or even if you're in that local space where it's a small restaurant, you know, but, but you you serve a good, you do a good lunch business. I mean, there's a lot of convenience related to that. So, so there, those are two, those are two things you can really kind of think about as you think about, you know, what, what, you know, what purpose we serve as a category right now. I think we serve a pretty massive purpose. I, I mean, I, you know, restaurants are pretty important in people's lives. So, um, you know, uh, that, that, that gives me hope that there will always be demand for our category in our different segments. Let's talk about culture. Um, culture is difficult to build in a new business, um, but it's even harder to scale in a large organization. And when I, re when I talk about you behind your back, John, I refer to you as the king of culture. When you okay. talk about road mapping and scaling, um, it, it's so inspiring and so actionable at the same time. Can you provide some of the tactics, tools, and strategies that you've used to scale culture in a large organization? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, I think one thing is you, you, you try to try to understand how and why, you know, an organization, you know, kind of what makes it tick, right? I mean, what, at, at the end of the day, why are people enjoying working there? Why, why do they like to be there? What makes it special to them? Why do our guests, you know, feel like it's a special place to be? Are those two things connected, the, 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 the guest and, and the employee and, 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 you know, should they be? Um, one of the tactics that I, that I've used that have really helped me over the years is, you know, hopefully if you're in a leadership position, if you, you know, you're, you're thinking of yourself as a level five leader and that's, you know, somebody that's selfless and, um, asking questions and, and trying to get answers out of the organization, out of the people in the organization, right. More than just, you know, tell directing. And, and I think that's a big part of it is understanding the organization um, and, and, and what makes it special to the employees and the guests and, and taking that then and saying, these are the things that we've heard. This is what our culture really is. So then you have that baseline of that culture, that real reality. You may have to do, you know, a little employee survey to really validate some of that. Just some employee satisfaction goes a long way. If you're a franchise or you may want to talk to your franchisees and get some of their feedback and maybe do a little survey with them to understand, okay, is this, is, you know, are, are we in a good place, not in a great place? And then you just take all that reality and you start talking about how important culture is. You just have to have a starting point. And once you have that starting point, then you can decide, um, okay, this is what that looks like um, on paper. Now let's think about how we bring it to life. And that's the fun part. That is the part around, hey, you know, these are the things we heard from our employees that make them love to be here and love to work at the brand. Here are some of the things that we can do to evoke that. And I use that word very purposefully because it's not about a sign on the wall, because it, if you put a sign on the wall, you better be backing it up. If you know, you're, I'd rather not put the sign on the wall and just have everyone talk about it as, Hey, this is how I feel. This is really how it works. This is what we do, how we behave, right? That whole you know, um, how we do it is, is as important as what we do. So that type of mindset and getting the right, you know, um, I think, I think you've got to have a, you've got to be purposeful around it. Like I said, 
it should be something that you're able to deliver and, and light and, and, and hopefully evoke. And, um, and then you get the leadership and the team just holding each other accountable and having fun with it. Right. And just, you know, behaving the ways that, that are your core values. And, and I think it doesn't happen overnight sometimes, unless you get really lucky and you find that, Hey, the organization's already this way. So all we have to do now is make it better. And so now what are the ideas to keep it top of mind and have town hall meetings and ongoing listening sessions and, and make sure that we're having some fun, right? And we're rewarding and recognizing people. Um, and, and they're connecting that this is, we behave this way because we care and we behave this way as an organization because, you know, it's bigger than just the bottom line here. And we realize that we realize that our people serve our guests. And if our people feel really good about what they're doing, then our guests are going to feel really good about our brand, right? So, um, yeah, that's that's generally the approach. But it, it takes rolling up your sleeves and getting with your leadership, or if you're a small business, you know, sitting down with your general manager um, and maybe your team members and talking through it and really trying to, you know, be transparent about, you know, what that looks like for you and if it can be meaningful um, for your business, then you run with it. Isn't that such an interesting dynamic? You know, I, I feel like it is as business owners, as leaders, we spend a lot of time in corners guessing, trying to figure out what people are thinking. You know, yeah. what's going to motivate my team? What's going to inspire my customer base to come back more frequently? When all you have to do is ask, which was ask them. Yeah. the foundational thing that you said there, which is just, it starts with a conversation. You don't need to figure it out. They'll tell you. Right. Absolutely right. Ask the question, find, get, search for the answer. And it doesn't take mega, mega dollars to do that. Just, just be creative and get there. Let's talk about marketing, probably one of the biggest hurdles in our industry. What is the blueprint for marketing a restaurant in a new market? Obviously, you know, you work for a company that had a prolific brand, but regionally. And so like yeah. when you enter a new state or a new territory, what are proven practices to build that brand awareness? Yeah, you know, over the years, just, you know, whether it be in my old retail days or even in my restaurant days, you know, it, it's funny, so much of it is is um, very common across, across you know, um, different sectors of consumer, you know, multi-unit consumer. And, um, you know, the, the, the big thing when you think about the blueprint for marketing is you have got to execute well in the early days, right? So, so I hate to go to something that someone would say, well, that's not really marketing. It is. I mean, whatever you're selling, in our case, it's food. If that food is right, if it's great, if the experience is, 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 is good. Um, and, and I know sometimes I say good because sometimes it's tough to have a great experience in a new restaurant, in a new market, because everybody shows up and you're overwhelmed, right? But you should anticipate those things. You should really think about, okay, if you've invested in the right real estate and you're in the right spot, so out of the gate, day one, how do I just wow people? How do I create wow experiences with my brand, with my restaurant? Um, is the food where it needs to be? Are we delivering it the way it needs to be delivered? Is, are the people, do the people have smiles on their face? Are they hustling? Are they taking care of guests? You know, they're, you know where, where I've seen failures over the years, whether it be in retail or restaurants, so much of the blocking and tackling just got missed. And so many people come into those first few weeks and months to try to experience the new, you're the new kid on the block, right? The new brand in town and guests are trying to figure out how does this one fit in my life? Not too sure. Let's see if they can prove to me how they fit in my life and, and if it's worth my time, money, et cetera. And, and so those early, early weeks and months or so, they're going to form an opinion quickly. And, and in some cases, I hate to say it, but you may only have one shot. And, and, and so, um, you know, your best marketing tool is getting out of the gate with a really strong operating plan and a really strong experience plan that people can really, you know, feel good about when they leave your restaurant. Cause it's really about, you want them to come back again. They come back again, do it again. They'll come back again. Right. So that, that's a fun, just a fundamental truth. As far as the marketing goes, I mean, there's so much cool stuff to do now. I mean, it's, you know, social media and digital marketing and the ability to kind of dive into, you know, specific zip code marketing and trade area type marketing that, gosh, you know, 20 years ago, didn't have access to that sort of thing. <laughs> it was, uh, 
you know, we were all just working hard trying to make it work when you went into a new market with a new store, right, or a new restaurant. Um, so, you know, thinking about do you have dollars to put to work? Um, you know, I, I think if you're a smaller entrepreneur or a smaller, you know, um, restaurant, um, the local marketing angle is a really good market, you know, angle to take, getting integrated into the neighborhood, building relationships with, you know, the, uh, you know, I, we, I've, I've seen franchisees just do wonderful jobs with, you know, it's a, it's a brand that connects with, you know, schools or local community things. And they, they have programs where they just go in and it's just talking and it's just getting word of mouth. And it's just maybe giving some bounce back type, you know, couponing and things like that to get that going and framing it as part of the community. Right. So, so, I mean, I'm not going to be able to educate everybody here on neighborhood marketing and local marketing strategies, but uh, you know, I think if you're, no matter what your budget size is, you can figure out, you can solve for those sort of things, but it takes effort. It takes, you've got to want to do that. So step one would be your, your food, your people, your get it, get it right. Cause you're going to have folks coming in. And step two then would be, um, you know, thinking, really thinking hard about what that right marketing strategy is, the trade area level. And, and I think if, if you're a one unit operator, that's going to maybe try to move to two units or three units, you know, the, the, the marketing spend can increase over time, but that's only if you get to two and three and four units, right? So, um, you know, think about those blocking and tackling fundamentals first, focus on the experience, and then, you know, build that marketing plan that suits your budget, right? There's just a lot of tools out there, a lot, a lot of great tools. And I would add two other pages from your playbook. So yeah. the first is that you start marketing a location long before you open. Great point. I, I, Right. I think for, for most of the independents, you're so busy building it, you're so busy branding it and all of that, that you don't think to like pick up your phone and let people know what you're working on and that this is coming and take them through the menu development and the building process and building that anticipation for this great thing that's coming. Usually yeah. we start marketing two to three weeks after we open. Uh, and the other thing that you've done a masterful job of is out the gate data collection, right? That, that you are out there trying to enroll people in the loyalty program, trying to make sure that this new crowd of people that comes in has the opportunity to communicate with you on an ongoing basis. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's really important. Those are great points, Josh, and, and definitely pieces and parts that need to get evaluated in a plan. I love the idea of getting out there early. And if you can start to build buzz and use social media to do that and, you know, coming soon, countdowns always are great tactical ways to, you know, to make that happen. But you hit the nail on the head on both of those points. I think you're, you're, you're spot on. You've got to, you got, you've got to use those tools that are going to create loyalty, right? You're starting at the very top of the funnel and it's just, you know, the top of the funnel is awareness. It's okay. I'm aware. Now I'm going to come in and use it. And you want to push them down the funnel to that loyal user. And it takes visits to be able to do that. And, 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 you know, it, it's, you know, I've seen local operators do it masterfully. I mean, it's, you know, so, so have a plan, have a strategy, use the tools. All great. And, then, and then the next question I have, I actually, I want to, I want to adjust it a bit based on what they asked versus something you said earlier. It says, how do you make a brand stand out in such a competitive market? But I, I, I think a more direct question to ask is if we're all selling food and beverage, what is your value prop? Yeah. How do you differentiate yourself? You know, and, and I'm, I'm curious to know, how did you guys do that? What, what value props do you find resonate outside of that food and beverage? Yeah, no, I think, I think um, the, the value, you know, when I think about value, right, a lot of folks go to pricing and price value and it, especially in, in the fast food category and uh, limited service restaurant category, but as you get up the ladder, obviously, and you're thinking about casual, fine dining, you know, you name it. I, I think the the value prop, you know, definition changes quite a lot, right? You start to really see quality and experience come into the value prop, um, and, you know, and in making sure, you know, that that the food is a wow. And you know, to my point earlier, I think as you as you move up the ladder, that becomes a lot more important um, at the right at the right price, right? It's you know, it's what you get for what you pay. That's what the price value. It, you know, it's you know, or value means, I mean, it's, it's what you get for what you pay. And, and, you know, um, so, so I think you can create a simple equation to try to understand that for yourself. It's really easy, right? It's going to just lay it out. What is my value prop? So 
what they get for what they pay, right? Is it experience? Is it convenience? Is it price, right? Is it, is it the food? You know, what part does the food play and how does that fit across those levers? So lay your levers out and just try to understand it. You know, it doesn't have to be a big research study if you don't have the means. It, it, you know, um, it can be as simple as that and you really starting to understand or, or at least develop a strategy around, okay, these are the two or three things we're going to just do really well that are going to ladder to our value prop. Now, tactically, I'm going to go support the heck out of that. So if it's, if it's quality, what, is, what does that mean for your concept? Maybe it's that you, you're, you're bringing in a, a protein that is very unique that you know you have on the menu that is kind of your signature thing that you do highlight it talk about it right as a use it as a means to talk about quality and to ladder up to your value proposition if it's a it, you know if it's a low price leading type of an idea that you have like appetizers that are low priced or a variety play use that as say okay that's part of my value proposition so i want to make sure everyone knows about that cuz that gets their foot in the door right and then i use other things on my menu and my my servers or my, you know, my menu, my point of order to educate folks on other items or other things that I want to sell them that I think if they, if they eat, they're going to feel really great about and want to come back tomorrow. Right. So I, I think that, you know, that that's how you, you've got to think about your own uniqueness, your own differentiation and really, really drive that, really drive that home. It's, this is not a world anymore where it's easy to be a vanilla, you know, type of a brand. It's just not, it's, a, you, you've got to have those things that make you stand out and that you and your teams can stand behind. Great advice. The next question is, how did you work with or work around supply chain shortages? I mean, especially at scale. Um, collaboration, transparency, communication. Um, you, you know, it's so very important. You know, you, know, you gotta have your plan A's, your plan B's in place. So whether that be you know, primary, secondary supply, whether it be tertiary, depending on how large you are. Um, yeah, you got to have a game plan and you've got to be as proactive as possible around trying to, um, you know, game theory, these situations that could, could occur. I mean, that's really what, you know, the focus needs to be is where are the gaps? What are, where are, where are their risk areas and how are we then building plans to make sure that those things, if they do happen, um, we're put, we're in a position to where we know exactly where we're going to toggle. So in this kind of an environment, it's kind of like when you build a crisis management plan, right? You never want any of it to happen, <laughs> you know, but if it does, I immediately open this binder. I go to this, you know, I, I call this number and, and we have a team that helps us there to do A, B, C, and D, right? And we are ready. And, and these are the things that you, I, I call these things, you know, risk mitigation. And we're probably in the, you know, um, we're probably at the height of it right now, just given what's happening out in the world today with, with you know, supply and, and shortages. And you see it everywhere you go, right? It's not, it's not any one restaurant that's having trouble. It seems like it's everywhere. You know, you go to some of the biggest chains on the planet here and uh, they're running out of sleeves for cups of coffee and they're running out of ingredients and you got signs on the door. And, and uh, you know, so those aren't easy things. Those are things as, as restaurateurs that we've been taught that should not happen. <laughs> that is, that's not how we do business. And, and our supplier and vendor partners have been taught that's not how we serve our customers, right? We, we have answers, we have solutions and um, everyone's been put in a really challenging situation. So, you, you know, uh, the headline for me is give yourself options, think through the options, go, you know, plan A, plan B, plan C, know what you're going to do if plan A fails and you're in a, in a, in a tight, you know, pinch backed into a corner, what are you going to do? You know, if it's a core ingredient that is critical to your menu, I hope you have, you know, you know, secondary tertiary type of um, supply ideas so that if you need to go down that route, you can. And I know it's very difficult right now because a lot of our, um, you know, a lot of supplier and vendor partners are also feeling the pinch on labor and having trouble producing um, so it's just more phone calls that need to get made and, you know, it's tenacity, right? I mean, that, that's what's going to rule the day. And that's, Hey, listen, that's the restaurant business, you know, we're a tenacious group of people here. Um, and if it's not this, it's something else usually. So we're always working through these sorts of situations. So you got to take the same sort of mentality, um, with, with the, you know, current events right now. So. Last question related to that, because you brought up communication, and I'm sure that it's in reference to your team, to your leadership, to your vendors. What about your customers? 
Is, is there a way to message this to your customers in a way that works to your advantage? Yeah, I think I think you need to be, I, I think being open and honest about what's happening if something like that does occur, I think is your best, probably the best thing that you can do. Um, it creates disappointment when you walk in and that one thing that you were hoping to get is not there and not available and, and there's no getting around it. It's going to create some disappointment. So thinking about what your kind of recovery strategy is, I think, is, is, a, is a way to kind of talk about it. And, and one, one angle might just be, just be transparent. Hey, li- hey, listen, the truck didn't come this week and or, you know, we're very sorry, but there's a shortage. And, and you've seen some of the biggest brands on the planet, by the way, do that. Be transparent about that. So that's only going to soften the blow so much. The other piece in the environment that we're in today, remember, it's happening everywhere. So that, that love, you know, that level of trend, that won't be a surprise. It's not like it's five years ago and it happens and folks look at you like, oh, wow, this is an unreliable brand. I think guests are giving more credit and more credence to this is actually happening in the world. It's on the news. This is real. So maybe you're best to be transparent about it, but then have solutions, you know, and, and hey, we don't have that, but we have this and let us help you out. Let us take care of you. Right. I mean, that's where our hospitality and our service kicks in. Um, so none of these things are fun. You'd rather just be in stock and 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 be, be selling guests what they want. But but the times that we're in, it just takes, you know, you know, I think that, you know, it just takes a good plan and, and make sure that you're communicating with your guests as well as your employees and your operators so that they they know how to handle it. Right. Put them in the best position to succeed and win. Um, don't don't blindside them at the last minute. If you've got multi stores, I mean, or multi restaurants, give them the notice that they need and the plan that they need to be able to make a bad situation, you know, a decent or even a good situation. Maybe you can turn it and make it a great situation um, for that guest. 100%. Uh, this, you, I, so we did one of these with Mark Canlis and, and the question was asked this way, which is why I kept it this way. But he said, lure is such a terrible word to use when talking about bringing talent into the hospitality industry because we shouldn't be luring people, but it's still a somewhat appropriate word. What tactics do you use to lure and retain talent? Yeah, I mean, I think um, um, recruit and retain might be a good yeah. way to think about yeah. this, right? Um, <laughs> recruiting talent, retaining talent, developing talent is the other, probably the third leg of the stool. Um, so listen, re- recruiting is, is so much of it is about what you're trying to accomplish as a brand and, and can you create opportunities for people that they can, that are tangible, that they can see. I mean, the restaurant space is a great space to come and build a career. Um, you, you come in, work hard, serve guests, you know, learn how to work as a team, learn how to work shoulder to shoulder. There are so many benefits to coming and working in the restaurant business that you are going to get that are going to help you your entire life. And, and, you know, and, and, and so if you can, if you can think about it that way on the recruitment front that we are going to bring you in and we're going to give you life skills, we're going to give you experiences and we hope you stay with us and develop with us because we're going to give you that opportunity too. But if you don't, we're going to give you um, skills that are going to translate to the rest of your life. And, and, and I'm being very, uh, you, you're probably hearing me say this and you're going, oh, okay, easy for this guy to say, right? Um, but it, it's a mindset. And, and that may come together at the smallest way, depending on the size of the restaurant or the operation, um, or it may come together in a massive way, you know, a massive way that you've got marketing behind it and all kinds of, you know, things around it, right? Um, so you start with the mentality, then tactically you start to think about, okay, we're no different than going in and recruiting, you know, guests, right? And trying to get guests to come into your business. Where are the places in my community that I can go and get talent? You know, you know, have I built a memo or have I thought about digitally sharing my information with these that, that we want talent and we are we want to develop and invest in talent. We want to take care of people. We want to give them life skills. We want to is that word out in your community? Have you gone to the you know, the schools? Have you gone to the community centers? Have you gone and tried to build those relationships to do that? Because it really is no different than than marketing. Um, it's, it's a very similar piece. And then when they get there, that's where the whole culture, you know, what's in it for me, you know, um, you know, re- retention comes in. And I think, you know, I think Josh, you and I talked about this last time we talked, I mean, I never view it as just pay, right? Pay is a component of, of why I feel good about working for a brand or working for someone. 
the way I'm treated and respected is, is, a, is a piece that, you know, I, I have a lot of employees say, I stay here because I get treated with respect. I get opportunities to speak my mind or, or, or help us get better as a brand. That's why I stay, because I trust you, right? Or I trust our leadership. I trust my store manager, my general manager. So, so, th so that's a piece to it, right? How you treat people is a big piece to it. Um, are you taught telling them a story that they of development? Are you are you talking to them about how they can develop their career? Maybe they're, you know, maybe they could become an assistant manager. Maybe they can become a general manager. Have you have articulated to any of them that what that looks like? That hey, you can actually make a living at this, right? You may be coming in as a dishwasher or a busser or, you know, um, working behind the scenes at a fast food restaurant or as a cashier. Um, but why can't you tell a story of the many, many thousands of people that have made a career of this of this wonderful category that we're all in and how people have been highly successful, right? I mean, you know, I started as a customer service representative making minimum wage at a at a store, at a retail store, and you know, wound up being the store manager at some at one point, right? And that is that those stories are all over, all, all over. So if you can if you can build that momentum and tell that story and then create real tools around it to retain employees. I think that's a big deal. And don't forget to train them. I mean, put them in a position to win. Um, the last thing that, that, that you want to have happen, think about it. If you were the employee coming in for your, you know, to, to do a job and you really want to please your boss, you really want to please, you know, the folks that are working with you, you want them to know that they can count on you and you go and you get thrown into this environment it's fast paced, it's crazy, it's Friday night at, a, at the bar or it's lunch at fast food, right? Drive through and, and you don't help them to understand what's happening and what their role is and how, you know, give them the tools to be successful. How do you think they're gonna feel after a few weeks? Why do you think turnover, you know, in the first 30 days is, is at the highest level it's probably ever been in our entire, you know, in, in the history of our category, right? I mean, it's a lot of that's happening, it's just, we don't have the time. We don't have the money. There's a lot of things that people are saying, but the reality is if they don't get trained right, they can't serve your guests well. And then you're, you're also risking them as an employee and you're going to, you're likely, the odds are based on the math and based on the numbers in our category, the odds are you are going to turn them over. You're probably going to turn them over sooner rather than later. So, so it, I know it's tough. I, I know it's tough out there and, and labor's you know, um, you know, wage is one of those things that we're also using as a lever right now as a category to try to get good folks in, in that recruitment funnel. But, um, you know, listen, if you're an entrepreneur and you've got one restaurant, do you want people that don't know how to execute your food and don't know how to serve your guests with your investment? I don't think so. I think you're going to kind of look at that and go, no, I need A players and I need A players that are trained and that's how I'm going to be successful. So anyway, you know, I hope I'm not trying to be controversial. It's just the brass tacks of what we got to get done right now. It's, you know, it's never easy day to day, but it's a people business and that's what makes it fun. Watching people win, watching people grow, develop those folks that call you five years later and tell you, Hey, you don't realize it, but you changed my life. Here's what I'm doing now. I mean, that's a big part of why we're here. That's why we're in this business. So, yeah, our last conversation, there was this pivotal moment in my own professional life when you talked about road mapping, which I think is an excellent tool because, you know, in, in, in working as a coach with, with independent restaurants, they'll say, you know, how do you convince someone that working as a dishwasher is a great job? And it's not. It's a terrible job. But it's a great opportunity if you have road mapped out that they can turn to their friends and say, I am a dishwasher today, but in 90 days, there's a review and they could teach me how to cook on the line. That's and right. then I could become the chef de cuisine. And then eventually I could become my own franchisee. And, and, so, and, by, the, and by the way, Josh, you could easily outline that. I mean, that's the thing is that that is, you know, I've, you know, we've done that in, past, in my past lives. Um, I've seen other brands do that. And it's, here's where you're at today. Here's the progression. And, and, and that, that goes back to the point around, you know, part of retention is helping them see the path. What kind of skills are you going to give them and what kind of opportunities are you going to provide? It can be a really great career. And, um, you know, so, so I think, I think your point is, is that, that is a great point. 
And it's not something, it just takes think time. It doesn't take a lot of money to do it. It's think time and it's being purposeful. And, um, you know, and, and that creates, that also can create the culture, right? If you don't have a culture, maybe that creates your culture that, hey, we, what we do is we develop people and we, you know, we give them the opportunity to decide if they want to be part of the restaurant category for life, you know? And that's yeah, that, it because in working in this industry, you just, you can do anything in this world because the yeah. job requires such a dynamic skill set that if you can excel in hospitality, you can excel in anything, but you can't sell the dishwashing job. You have to sell the education. Sure. Sure. Agreed. What steps did you take to stay consistent, consistent as a leader, consistent as a brand? Um, you know, it, it's especially when you find yourself at the top of the food chain finally, and you have your own business and you're standing at the helm, you're drowning in great ideas. How do you avoid the temptation? <laughs> Well, so one thing I'd say is leaders are always learning and you're never done learning. You're always learning and, and you should always put yourself in an environment to learn. And there, there's so many great folks out there that are doing things different ways, evolving. Yeah, you, you, you have to understand that and the, the kind of what, what they're doing, why they're doing it and you know how it applies to you and your leadership, right? And so looking yourself in the mirror, having people around you that you know, whether it be mentors or folks that you look up to that you're able to have open and honest conversations about. It doesn't matter if you're CEO or you're, you know, director of operations or, you know, running your own restaurant. I mean, these are the conversations that help you thrive. These are the conversations that help you look in the mirror, help you think about, you know, am I, am I where I need to be as a leader? Do I need to evolve a bit? You know, is the environment changing and maybe I'm not, my ways aren't exactly the, 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 the way that's going to be successful today. Right. And, and I think we all have to be open and willingness as big leaders. And let, that's what a level five leader does is, is, um, you know, absolutely thinks that way. So, so I think, you know, the way to stay consistent is, the, is, is through evolution. And I know that sounds counterintuitive, but, you know, if you want to be a big leader, a great leader, you can be consistent with things like people and your, your core values and the way that you, you know, you operate and, and, and talk to people and, and behave, right? Those are going to be consistent things that, that you always want to probably maintain. Um, but, but the other things, you know, as a leader, you can get really bogged down in the details and, and if you're not careful. And so tips that I give folks when, you know, that I'm mentoring or, or folks that are kind of saying, hey, you know, you seem to have this all figured out. No, no. It's a, it's a constant, it's something that I'm always thinking about. I'm always thinking about where am I at? Am, am, I, am, I, am I giving my business what, what it needs? Am I, am I giving my people what they need to be successful and to thrive? Um, and always asking that question and never just sitting back and being complacent that I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I've got all of this thing, all of this figured out. I don't think anybody does. So, you know, techniques that I use, I have people around me that I can talk to that others, you know, in, at, your, at my own level, CEOs that I can talk to very open and honestly, mentors that I've used over the years that I can talk to very open and honestly. Um, feedback from the business, as we talked about earlier, is always a good way to tap into, hey, how are we really doing? Um, you know, the, 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 you know, are we being consistent? Are we doing what we said we were going to do? Are we prioritizing? And, th and those are things that you just sometimes, you know, the little tips that I give folks is just making notes, putting it in your calendar. You get bogged down in the day to day and three weeks goes by and you, you know, you've probably gotten a lot accomplished in those three weeks, but maybe the one or two big rocks that you're focused on that helps the organization stay on a steady path or your group to stay on a steady path, making sure you make notes, making sure you make time. Um, so that you don't let that get away. Those are always, you know, those are easy, you know, ways to do it. But um, evolution is the is the way that I think about consistency these days. So I love it. Um, what does a profitable delivery model look like? If we could get practical and actionable, is is that something that exists? Well, I mean, if you're, it, you know, technically you put dollars in the bank, not percentages, right? So if you're putting extra dollars in the bank and it's real money that is profitable, it may be at a lower margin percentage. You got to ask yourself, am I, do I like putting those dollars in the bank or does the margin, is the margin percentage so offensive that it's not worth my time? Um, I think most of us would say, hey, we put dollars in the bank 
And um, the other thing is, is there's an argument out there that that delivery is highly incremental. You know, I've heard some say 60%, 70% incremental. Some have said a little bit higher. Some have said a little bit lower. So call it 50% incremental or 50 plus percent incremental. So that means that if you're not there, there's 50% call it that won't come. Um, they're not getting off. They're not going to get off the couch. It's a convenience play. And that's just what they're going to do. And, and maybe it's 40 or 50%, maybe 30% you know, that, that will wind up getting in the car and coming down to the restaurant. Right. So, so there's a real practical reality there that you've got to, you've got a way, you know, I think understanding what that check average looks like, depending on your segment, you know, there, there's a lot of um, most, most of the, you know, if you get in the limited service segment, a lot of times those delivery check averages are much higher than what you um, get at the four wall level. So you have penny profit coming in um, that, you know, at a higher level, off of that check average, even, even, you know, so that gives you a little bit of leeway. You've got commission rates and fees that you've got to deal with that changes your margin profile a bit. So you've got to think about, is there a premium pricing play here? What does that do to my check average? Is it going to be offensive to my guests? Is that a way that I can buffer my margin a little bit, kind of offset some of the commission so that it makes it worth my while as well? Um, and does that fit my value proposition? Um, you know, and, and de depending on the segment you're in, you really got to think through that. Cause if, you know, you, you know, if you're, if you're in the, if you're in um, quick service, as an example, you're dealing on lower check averages generally. And, um, so the impact of that check average may not be quite as much if you're saying, Oh, I, I think I could pass through 10% or 15%. Maybe that's reasonable. And for convenience, my guests might say, yes, that's reasonable. Um, but as you get up the ladder and you're in casual or fine dining and those check averages are becoming bigger and bigger, you know, hey, 10%, 15%, 20% starts to look, it starts to get noticed. So, oh, yeah. so you got to step back and look at the levers, right? So the levers are demand. Am I going to lose demand? Am I going to lose traffic if I'm not there? Can I get through it with, without being there? Then you've got to look at, you know, how I'm gonna, how am I gonna make money at, at this? Our, our conversation about value prop earlier absolutely applies here. What's my value prop? What should I price on delivery? Because there is convenience that is relative, right? And a lot of other brands are doing it. And and I think the consumer is expecting some level of convenience fee associated with it. And then you just kind of put it all together, and there's your model. So you're either happy with what it spits out, or you're not. <laughs> and then that's just your decision. I mean, that's. That, that's your decision weighing those, but I would, I would weigh it against, you know, try to be as systematic and strategic about the way that you're weighing it and don't get emotional about it. I mean, it's just, it, it, there's no reason to get emotional about it. It is a, can I make it work pragmatically and rationally for my business, for my guest or not? And, and if, if the answer initially is no, think creatively, think outside the box. Are there ways I might be able to tweak this a bit? It's just, levers, right? I'm going to tweak this one here. I'm going to tweak that one there and just keep working it. And eventually you'll either get comfortable or you won't, but, 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 but I think there is a way to be profitable here. Yes. I love that. And that's a great formula to utilize. Um, so you brought up a couple of times level five leaders, which is a quote from Jim Collins. Good to great, right? Yep. Curious to know other than Jim Collins and good to great, which is a fantastic book that everybody listening should read. What books have influenced your leadership style or the way you look at business? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, obviously, Good to Great's been massive. That was a game changer for me when I read it for the first time. And, me too. And thinking about you know, how he took a very quantitative approach and the research, you know, that went behind trying to understand these leaps from Good to Great, and so so many, you know, just practical ideas in there. I mean that you can look at and go, wow, you know, do we really have the right leadership structure? Do I have the right people in the right seats on the bus? You know, what's my hedgehog, you know, concept, you know, these, these are just, just such a, it's so fundamental, right. To, to, you know, to business. I, you listen, there's one that I remember, uh, I don't know, 20, 20, 25 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, I was, um, a bit of a road warrior. I was head of, um, I was, I was kind of running one part of the country for field marketing for another brand. And, um, I, I remember I sat down and this gentleman sat next to me and he said, Hey, have you read this? And he shows me this book. I said, no, I haven't read it. And, um, it was a book called the present. 
And, and um, I can't remember the name of the author. I have it. I've given it to people and I always forget the author's name. So I apologize. Um, so the present, just like a gift, right? The present. And the whole idea around it was, you know, it was so simple. It was an easy read. It was just this story about this, this guy who was, you know, basically going through life and multitasking and, you know, type of person that you're, you're in a meeting and you got the phone going and you're doing the computer and you're not really, are you really there? Are you really present? Right. And it took throughout the story, the evolution of this, of, you know, it was, was finally realizing what it meant to be truly present. Right. So the, the idea of if someone comes into your office to have a meeting with you, there's a reason they're in there to have them, that meeting be all in. Otherwise don't have the meeting. If, if don't waste their time, don't waste your time. So, you know, if, if you need to sit down and talk about an issue and you think it's worthy of saying yes and accepting the meeting, be present. If you're going to have a conversation with your, with your wife about something important or your husband or your son or your daughter or your mom, or your dad, whatever. If you don't have time to have the conversation, don't have the conversation. Hey, time out. I got to let's, let's catch up on this tomorrow. Right. But if you're going to have it, make it meaningful, be there, be engaged. And it's amazing we all, I'm not going to say that I'm perfect at this whatsoever, but it's something that has been on my mind since I read that book. And since that was handed to me 20 years ago, every day, I think about that. I, I, I literally, I think about it. And when I'm sitting in a meeting and I see somebody on their phone or I accidentally check my phone, it, it just, I immediately go, John, be present. You're, you're having this meeting for a reason. Like, because, because I think you can be a lot more efficient you can be a lot more effective if you're just all in for that 30 minutes, right? knock it out, get it done. Otherwise you could have five other meetings about it. And you realize, well, I had five other meetings because I never really engaged on the thing the way I needed to. And it could have been one meeting, right? So anyway, it, it applies to everything from personal to business. And anyway, it's not, it, you know, it's not so much a business book as it just is a, maybe a life skill book that has always stuck with me and one that I've always loved to talk about with folks. I love that. Yeah. The next question is, what is the hardest decision you've had to make as a CEO? But I mean, we can extrapolate this out to just the hardest leadership decision you've made. And we don't need the specific context, but talk to me about how you felt and the way you work through it. Yeah, I mean, I think the, here's something that we can all relate to, right? And that's the pandemic. I mean, how many folks were put in a position to make some of the toughest decisions of their professional career, not just once, but almost daily for a period of time. And, and um, that was very, remember the first days, right? How difficult that was. Uh, some of the things we were faced with. And um, the, way that, the, the way that we worked through it, you know, at the time was we had a set of core values. And, and I think the, 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 the folks on the leadership team said, hey, these core values should really be part of our decision-making process. Let's organize around this very quickly. Let's get a plan together and decide who's, who's doing what here. And let's think through strategy as fast as we can on, um, you know, at the time it was, there was a lot of conversation around crisis management. There was, there was conversation around business recovery. And then there was conversation about how do you really accelerate out of here, out of this situation and start to get the brand back on track again. And, 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 and getting really organized about having a plan and openly and transparently talking about the issue. And, how, and it was tough. Everyone was dealing with this unbelievably tough, facing these tough issues every single day. Um, it was just all about communication, transparency, holding each other accountable to our plan, adjusting it, being nimble. And I think everybody on this, you know, on this uh, call is probably if you look back to how you behave now compared to how you behaved pre-March 2020, I think you'd all probably say, man, I'm a lot more nimble now than I've ever been in my entire life. I'm a lot more agile in the way that I think. I'm, you know, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not as emotional in some of the ways that I think about, you know, tough issues because we faced them all, right? We faced them all over the last couple of years. So, so I'd say that that absolutely was the toughest period of my professional career, no doubt about it. I think it was for a lot of folks, but I think about us getting and moving through that fairly quickly. We, we did it, you know, just the leadership team, the, the organization, our franchisees, 
everyone just got together and just kind of locked arms and just said, okay, we're going to get through this. And we, we, we made it, you know, we, we made it a very, very, um, you know, it was our purpose to get through it together. And, 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 and so it took a lot of hard work and a lot of collaboration and communication, but that's how, you know, that's the only way to get through tough things. You know, it, it's, it's, you, you can't, you can't take it all on your own shoulders. Not one person has the answer. Um, it, it's a, it, you know, the more that you can get smart people around you that, that really care, the better you're going to be in the long run. And then you just got to trust that and you got to trust that process. 100%. We got time for one last question. Uh, so what levers did you use to ensure each location was consistently profitable? I mean, many of us are struggling to keep one location consistently yeah. profitable. So how does, how does it work at scale? What are those levers that you use to create and maintain profitability? Well, I think about, so my experiences are, you know, retail and restaurants, right? When I think about this, so it's, you know, four wall retail, four wall restaurant, multi-unit. Um, so when you're at scale, whether it's retail or restaurant, right, there's, there's the, um, there's the rack and stack that you're able to do. And that, that gives you a, that gives you a real advantage because you have lots of sample where, so it's easy to, you know, rack and stack and see where you're at by market, see where you're at by region, see what, where you're at by store and use that data to your advantage. I mean, it's so, so that's at scale, right? You have a lot of data and um, you have a lot of best practices to pull from as well. So you look at the stores that have similar profiles that are performing well and are profitable. Um, and you start to try to understand those best practices and what those common, you know, common themes are across those, those stores or restaurants. Um, whether it be retail or restaurants, and then you try to apply those things into these underperforming locations. And it's, you know, it always comes down to, you know, is it, you know, operations, marketing, right, real estate, um, you know, and, and um, when, you know, those are usually your main levers that you're going to evaluate if you say, hey, real estate is fine. Um, then you're going to write, write, go to what you can control. And as an operator, you should always go to what you can control first. And that's going to be operations and marketing and, and, and then just dive in deep and, and trying to figure that all out. And you may say, well, what if my cost of goods is off or what if, well, so, so many, so much of it comes down to operations. What's your waste? What's your food waste look like? You know, what's your, you know, how are you managing margins? How are you managing menu mix? What are you merchandising? What are you trying to sell? Right. That conversation earlier you know, what's your, what's your strategy on margin optimization, you know, and is it controllable in your operations? It probably, you probably have opportunity there, whether you like it or not, everybody does. Um, so you got kind of the big point of view of, you got a lot more data to deal with, which is great. So now I can share best practices from those great stores. But then even when you're smaller, you know, I think you can do it from a person, just a perspective of, it's just more of a, you know, I would do, I would just do a deep dive, you know, on, on, on where you're sitting and why, why you think you're not profitable and think about real estate operations and, you know, you know and marketing. And those are the, those are the things to dive into to, to try to sort that out. A lot of times though, I'll tell you from my experience, I, I tell this story from time to time. And this happened when I was in retail and it happened, when, you know, since I've been in restaurants, how many times have you seen a great general manager come in and take over a location that people are saying, it can't be profitable. We've been down in sales for the last two years, bad location, bad real estate. And all of a sudden Josh shows up and you're going three months later, why are my comps up 20% here? I thought it was bad real estate. I thought it was, <laughs> I thought it was a bad store. And, and I got to tell you in 30 years of doing this, it, I, those stories are unbelievably, there's so many of them. I can't, I couldn't even write them all down. And how many times I've heard, hey, it's a bad store, it's a bad location. That's why we're not profitable. That's why we're not driving sales. And all of a sudden, the right GM gets in there who really cares and knows kind of really what they're doing. And that thing turns on a dime. Now, this is not, that's not every situation. So don't get me wrong. That's why you got to look at all three levers. I'm just giving you my perspective. I've just seen it a lot where that great operator can really make a difference. I mean, can worth their weight in gold for sure. Who them what, right? Yeah. Yep. John, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. You, sir, are definitely a level five leader. Um, Appreciate that, Josh. As always, man, I, I take so Humble. much away from our conversations. And uh, and I'm sure that, that everyone on this and everyone that watches the video after the fact will as well. Thank you so much for taking the time.
Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Take care, everybody.